Hello, my name is Michael Lambert and uh, today I want to talk about two things. I, I want to talk again a little bit about how Brexit is going to affect small and medium sized businesses and uh, also I want to talk a little bit about um, forthcoming shortages because I think the shortages we've seen so far in the shops and so on uh, are, are, are just the beginning. Uh, this is going to be a very very serious problem especially um, throughout this coming winter. Before I do that, however, um, I, I, I want to ask you a favour. If you, if you approve of what I'm saying and you wouldn't mind subscribing, I'd be very, very grateful. Uh, I'm supposed to ask every time and I, and I always forget, but I'm very grateful to anybody who has subscribed and, uh, and uh, thank you if you are going to subscribe. So Brexit and small and medium sized businesses. I want to talk about a hypothetical example which will, I think, explain just how businesses are affected by Brexit. Now, imagine you've got a small business and you're supplying products, whatever it may be, um, and you're based anywhere. Let's say, for example, you're based in Yorkshire. And you spent many years building up this business and you sell your products all over the UK. And it's all going very well. It's taking you a long time because you've had to find these customers, you've had to show them your products, you've had to sample them, market them, and you've had to do trade fairs and all the rest. You've invested a great deal in building your business, but you've got a very nice successful business. You're making money, you're paying taxes, your customers are all selling your products and they're paying taxes and employing people and so on. So it's all going very smoothly, but it has taken a long time to build this business. Now, supposing some guy comes along, a sort of big mouth, an uh, ignoramus, and he... Um, Let's give him a name, for example, say, say he's called Nigel Forage, perhaps. And he comes along and he starts going around Yorkshire saying, you don't want to be controlled by, uh, by, by, by bureaucrats in Westminster. You want to take back control. You want to be independent. And suppose he went on and on about this. And uh, eventually the, uh, the county council said, well, OK, we'll have a referendum. And they had a ref referendum and by a small majority, People voted to become independent, get away from being bossed around by faceless bureaucrats, I think the word is, which means civil servants, uh, faceless bureaucrats in Whitehall. And so uh, Yorkshire became independent, able to stop people coming into the county to work, able to change their own standards. They could improve their standards if they want to, the product standards. They could reduce the product standards if they want to. The issue is that if they reduce product standards, they won't be able to sell them anywhere else. But never mind, they have this power now because they've taken back control. And supposing that then uh, you've got your business in, 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 in Yorkshire and you want to carry on exporting, but you find now that if you want to export, say, you want to sell to some customer in Lancashire, you've got to start writing out paperwork. You've got to cover an export documents. You've got to uh, employ an agent probably for that. Your goods will be inspected at the border when you leave Yorkshire. And your customer, when they get your goods, before they get them, they'll have to uh, employ an agent to fill out paperwork, import controls. Maybe if you're selling a food product, there'll be veterinary controls and health controls and all the rest of it, uh, documents and so on. And uh, they then perhaps have to pay duty if some of the goods are... Uh, 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 source elsewhere, you need a certificate of origin, cost you £53 a time, I think. And they'd have to pay VAT uh, when the goods arrived before they actually got them. Now what would happen? All those customers all over the UK would say, I can get these goods from other places, other suppliers. Why the hell am I going to deal with somebody in Yorkshire when I've got all this problem, all this hassle, sorted? And they would immediately stop dealing with your company in Yorkshire. And you'd be left with your own market. And you'd probably find it very difficult to struggle with a, a, a single county after having supplied a whole whole continent or a whole uh, country full of, uh, of counties. Or you could uh, move your business elsewhere. You could take your business out of the county. Or you could just go bust. And that really is exactly what is happening with Brexit. Thousands, tens of thousands of firms that have been happily dealing with 
countries all over Europe for years and years and years now find that that market is closed because the customers do not want the bother of dealing with a UK company. And it works the other way. It's so much bother now to export to the UK. Well, it isn't yet, but it will be that companies are not going to. In other words, what this does, it just reduces the amount of trade we're doing considerably. And that is the whole madness of Brexit in a, in a nutshell. You might have heard the other day, um, uh, um, Archie Norman, the, uh, the chairman of uh, Marks and Spencer, saying that to send a, a, a lorry now to the EU requires 700 pieces of paper. 700 pieces of paper. Marks and Spencer can afford to employ people to write out this completely pointless paperwork which serves no purpose whatsoever. But other firms can't. Small firms can't do that. It just isn't economic. And so for the future, new firms coming uh, into being, uh, instead of having a whole continent to supply, are stuck in the UK. That's the market. What does the government say? They say, oh, well, there's such a big world out there and we're going to join CPTPP. Why don't you go find some customers in, in Peru or Chile or, or New Zealand? Never mind the ones in, 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 in France and Belgium and Holland. Anyway, I wanted to talk also about shortages. Now, we all know there's, uh, there are shortages in the shops. We've all seen them. We've all gone in the supermarket, seen the gaps in the shelves and the, 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 the shelf units being moved around to hide the shortages of stock. Um, we've heard about the uh, shortage of the, uh, the vials for the blood and we've heard about the shortage of chemicals for the, uh, for the water companies so that they're tipping all their sewage into the, uh, into the rivers now or they're allowed to tip a certain amount of sewage into the rivers and so on. And... Uh, this is something that's just not going to go away. It's not temporary. This is not just something that, you know, a couple months' time is going to be fine. This is an ongoing problem. These problems at the moment are being caused by a shortage of drivers. The government will tell you, nothing to do with Brexit whatsoever. It's the pandemic and it's because drivers are retiring and because there are not, not enough drivers have been taking tests. It is nothing to do with that. It's because loads and loads and loads, thousands and thousands and thousands of East European drivers went home and they can't come back thanks to the Home Secretary's wonderful Australian point system for immigrants. So they're gone. And it's the same, of course, with so many industries, as with, 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 with care industry, with hospitality, with building and construction. Everywhere you look, there's a shortage of workers. And the government, of course, says, well, we're short of 100,000 drawers, we'll, 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 tra we'll train up some more, we'll train up some more, yeah, yeah. It's not a great job being a lorry driver. I know they're going to be paid a lot more money now. Almost certainly going to get a lot more money. It's not a great job, you know. It's not very healthy. You're sat down, hunched over a steering wheel for hours after hours after hours. You have to stay away sometimes. You sleep in the van. Facilities at transport uh, stops are not particularly good. It's not a nice life. People coming out of school don't think, I want to be a lorry driver. They might if they're going to get 50 grand, I suppose. But uh, it, it's, 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 there, there are certain jobs that we do not want to do. I said before, working in care homes, digging vegetables and fruit and vegetables and so on. People don't want to do those sort of jobs. But there are other reasons why there are going to be shortages. As from the end of this month, we start to introduce border controls for goods coming into the UK. Until now, let me just explain something. Supposing I'm a cheese manufacturer in the UK. I want to send a van load of cheese to France. I need health certificates. I need veterinary certificates. I need export documents. I need all this stuff. I'm going to have to employ somebody to write out all these documents. I take them to France. I get to Dover, drive right through Dover, get to Calais. They might want to turn the van out. They might want to see it. They might find problems with the documents. If they do, they have every right to turn the vehicle around and send you back. But if eventually you are allowed through, your customer then needs uh, needs uh, a customs agent to prepare all the import documentation to check everything customs check everything and then eventually gets his goods having paid duty or VAT or whatever he has to pay on import now a French uh, cheese producer wants to send 
geez to the UK, puts the shoes on the lorry, gives the driver a delivery note, the driver drives to England, drives to the warehouse, hands in the delivery note, it's signed, gets in his lorry and drives home, as it's always been for the last God knows how many years. At some stage, uh, the importer is supposed to notify uh, HMRC uh, within six months that they have imported that particular shipment. But that's it. Nothing. And that's why the shops have had plenty of European food available throughout, uh, well, all this year. Well, that's going to stop now because gradually we have to Im uh, impose uh, um, these, these, these import controls, which we should have imposed right from the beginning of the year, but we didn't because we weren't ready. Michael Gove told us we would have 50,000 customs agents. Clearly we hadn't. And then it was going to be later in the year, and then it was going to be uh, the end of the year. Now it's going to be uh, the end of this month, uh, beginning, and then it'll, that will continue through until the beginning of next year. Now, what this is going to mean is that anybody exporting food to the UK from the EU is going to face just the same complications, problems, hassles, expense as we face exporting food to the EU. And so again, lots and lots of smaller, medium-sized suppliers from the EU are going to say, sod it. We can supply anyone at 27 other countries. Why should we go through all this hassle just for one country? And so a lot of them are going to stop, stop sending, sending to the UK. So that's going to add to our food shortages. On top of that, uh, European drivers coming here are generally paid, as I understand, I understand to be corrected if it's not right, but I understand that they're paid per trip, per kilometre. In other words, they're paid uh, so much to go 250 kilometres there and back or whatever it is. And uh, if there are going to be delays, as there are going to be, because all this documentation has to be checked and there will be problems and there will be delays, there always are, always have been, they're going to say, I don't want to go to the UK. I don't want to drive there. I'm only going to pay to sit a fixed amount. I'm not going to go and sit for two days in Dover in some car park because the documentation is uh, being held up or because they want to take all the, the, the contents of the lorry out and check it. And so there's going to be a great reluctance for European drivers to even come here to deliver stuff. And then there's another point which is going to add to shortages. And this like, is very serious. It's something I haven't heard really discussed very much. And it is this. We all know that this year farmers, uh, market gardeners and so on have had a great deal of difficulty in getting workers to harvest their crops, the fruit and the vegetables and so on. Um, we've heard about it throughout the year, starting with a guy back in, in, in January in Cornwall with his millions of daffodils all rotting in the fields. And we've heard about time after time after time farmers have, uh, have, have left their crops to rot because they just couldn't get anybody to, to pick them now that the East Europeans no longer are able to come here. We heard, I think, last week, uh, 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 there was a talk of something like 10,000 pigs being slaughtered and burnt because there aren't enough workers in the abattoirs to, to, to process them. And apparently uh, a, a large portion of workers in the abattoirs have always been East European. So all these 10,000 pigs are going to be slaughtered and burnt. Now that is a phenomenal loss. Phenomenal waste. But the alternative, of course, is the farmer keeps the pigs alive and he just has to keep spending more and more money feeding them, feeding them, they get bigger and bigger and bigger and they'll sooner or later they'll be unsaleable. So if you're a farmer and you've lost 10, 20, 50, 100,000 pounds in rotting crops in the fields, or you've got a thousand pigs that are going to be burnt in your fields, do you think you're going to Start all over again next year and plant the same crops? Can you gonna rear more, more more pigs next year? Knowing what has happened this year? I doubt it. So a lot of these farmers, a lot of these uh, fruit and vegetable growers are gonna say sod it. It just isn't worth the risk. And so that's gonna add enormously to the shortages. So in almost everywhere you look, we're going to have shortages. And this is going to mean, inevitably, it's going to mean huge price increases. I mean, I don't know how this will pan out. I don't know how the government's going to, going to deal with this. But if there's a shortage, the prices will go up. 
And we know how many people are now struggling so much to survive on such limited income, especially with the uh, doing away with the uh, £20 a week uh, universal credit uplift. And of course, with uh, gas and electricity prices going up. And we've all seen the prices in the shops are already going up. And what happens when there's shortages of other things? I mean, I saw in, in the papers, you probably saw the other day, people panicking about whether we're going to have turkey for Christmas. God knows why everybody's so fussy about Christmas. But yeah, there's a big worry that it may not be turkey for Christmas. Maybe shortages of wine for Christmas. It seems to me people are going to be a bit cross about this. Maybe they weren't. But I think it's very, very serious situation we're in now. And the government seems completely clueless. And they really have no idea, no idea about business. You know, we've, as I've said many times before, business secretary, no experience of business whatsoever. We have uh, Liz Truss running all over, all around the world. Almost no experience of business. She worked for Shell for a while in some sales, sales job. Uh, we have the person who must be the stupidest person who's ever sat around a cabinet table, Lord Gormless, our chief Brexit negotiator. And these are the people who have our future in, in their hands and are going to have to deal with all this mess. And we have a prime minister who is famous for saying F-U-C-K business. Many of these videos I made, they've all been pretty, pretty negative. I mean, uh, there's a lot to be negative about. I and mean, we have such a, an incompetent government. Brexit is such utter madness. There are those who will still, and they'll be in my comments, I'm sure, after I finish this video. There are those who'll say, uh, get over it, you lost, and make the best of it, and get behind it at all. This is like standing on the, the, the deck of the Titanic, isn't it? And, and being told you're a Ramona when you complained about the fact that the captain deliberately drove at the iceberg. Embrace it. Embrace the sinking ship. We're in terrible trouble. Covid has, has really covered. It's camouflaged everything. It's been such a big distraction that everything, it's been possible to bring everything on, on, on Covid. And uh, that is an excuse, although it's still a very serious problem and it's going to go on being a huge problem. Uh, uh, that is an excuse. It's, it's going to be difficult to maintain much longer. And, and, and the, bare, the bare consequences of Brexit are going to become, become evident. And I think that's when people are going to, uh, going to start getting cross. Uh, I, I think we saw after, the, um, uh, after Johnson's announcement in the, in the Commons last week about the uh, um, care and so on, uh, his popularity ratings dropped quite a lot and I think they're going to just plummet from here because I think uh, I think we've all had enough really. We're all being treated like complete and utter idiots and to be to be honest an awful lot of people are idiots uh, um, particularly those who still say that Brexit is the best thing we've ever done because we've taken back control and going back to my uh, Yorkshire uh, um, uh, story uh, what control? What control? What's the point of having control when the people, your markets, the people you need to deal with are in control? Anyway, that's, uh, that's my moment for today. And uh, if you have, if you have um, found it interesting, please, and you don't mind subscribing, I'd be very grateful. And, and until next time, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.